Nearly a third of KCTS-9's donors give through the Pacific Coast Public Television Association. We thank the over 33,000 Canadian viewers who help make our quality programming possible here in the Northwest. 98.1 Classical King FM. Now listener supported. That means more live concert broadcasts. Learn more at king.org. Bringing you intelligent programs that inform, involve, and inspire. You're watching KCTS 9. This is BBC World News America. Funding for this presentation is made possible by the Freeman Foundation of New York, Stowe, Vermont, and Honolulu, Newman's Own Foundation, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and Union Bank. strength to work for a wide range of companies, from small businesses to major corporations. What can we do for you? And now, BBC World News America. This is BBC World News America. Reporting from Washington, I'm Jane O'Brien. As Al-Qaeda issues an intimate statement admitting bin Laden is dead, Barack Obama thanks and decorates the U.S. troops who killed him. It was a chance for me to say on behalf of all Americans and people around the world, job well done. Job well done. How brave are the Syrian protesters? In city after city, people take to the streets yet again defying government threats and violence. And how did Pablo Picasso end up in Richmond, Virginia? A museum there hosts a coveted exhibition featuring hundreds of his best-known works. So you have eight decades represented the entire spectrum, the sweeping spectrum of Picasso's career. Welcome to our viewers on PBS in America and also around the globe. Five days after the raid which killed Osama bin Laden, today a statement purportedly from Al-Qaeda confirms his death. The message posted on jihadist websites threatens retaliation, warning that America's happiness will be turned to sorrow. It also promises to release an audio recording that the Al-Qaeda leader supposedly made a week before his death. From Pakistan, the BBC's Ola Girin reports. This amateur video is said to show Osama bin Laden's bedroom, effectively his prison, the small space where he spent five years. We can't verify its authenticity. He may have passed the time here plotting new attacks. U.S. officials claim a handwritten note found in the compound sketched out a plan to derail a train in the U.S. on the 10th anniversary of 9-11. Today, near his compound in Bilal town, graffiti renaming the district and saying, long live bin Laden. But soon the security forces painted over the slogans and denied us access to the area. And just a few minutes away, another forbidden location, the local base of the ISI, Pakistan's main intelligence agency, which somehow failed or neglected to capture him. There have been protests on the streets, here and elsewhere, against the U.S. operation which killed bin Laden. The covert solo mission has inflamed anti-American sentiment. Well, the protesters are on the move now. It's a noisy demonstration here. There's a lot of anger about the raid on bin Laden's compound, but people here are also angry at their own rulers for cooperating with America. They condemned President Zardari, but most of the fury was aimed at President Obama. This man told us he would shoot the Americans himself 
if they ever returned. They attacked on the sovereignty of Pakistan, they attacked on the dignity of Pakistan, and they, they came into the territory of Pakistan. They have no right to, uh, to come in the territory of Pakistan. Demonstrators here say the Americans have killed bin Laden the man, not bin Laden the idea. Orla Giran, BBC News, Abbottabad. President Obama was in Fort Campbell, Kentucky this afternoon, addressing soldiers recently returned from Afghanistan. In his remarks, he vowed that al-Qaeda would ultimately be defeated and offered his gratitude to U.S. service members involved in the operation which killed Osama bin Laden. I came here for a simple reason, to say thank you on behalf of America. This has been a historic week in the life of our nation. Thanks to the incredible skill and courage of countless individuals, intelligence, military, over many years, the terrorist leader who struck our nation on 9-11 will never th uh, threaten America again. But while Osama bin Laden may be gone, could his surviving network still wreak havoc on the U.S. and other countries around the world? Well, here to help answer that is former State Department spokesman P.J. Crowley. Uh, Mr. Crowley, thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure, Jane. Now, al-Qaeda has already threatened America, um, but with its leader dead, do you think that it's in any position right now to carry out another attack? Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, not so much the core al-Qaeda. Uh, in Pakistan and, and in the, that area. But over the last uh, 10 years, Al-Qaeda has transformed itself. It's now a much more diffuse network. You've got uh, franchises in places like the Maghreb and places like Yemen. And in fact, uh, you know, the last couple of terrorism attempts against the United States had ties to Yemen as well as to Pakistan. So they're, they're certainly capable of doing that. So given that scattered organization, um, do you think that any of the information located on these laptops is capable of giving us information about preventing attacks in those parts of the world? Well, certainly, just as the revenge motive you know, gives them uh, an impetus to attempt something in the near term, by the same token, the fact that bin Laden's gone also gives intelligence and law enforcement an opportunity. Uh, they'll have to communicate in order to affirm Zawahiri's taking over as the presumed you know, leader uh, with bin Laden gone. Um, Others may try to, you know, fill that void. That means that there will be chatter in their network, and with chatter comes an opportunity for an intercept that could lead uh, to, uh, uh, to an arrest. But certainly um, the computers that uh, were found in, in bin Laden's room, uh, you know, do provide uh, additional information. Uh, some of the information might be dated, but uh, these are all uh, good intelligence finds. Now, moving on to the U.S. relationship with Pakistan, which, of course, is now very much in the spotlight, do you have any doubt that somebody within the Pakistani government knew that Osama bin Laden was there? Well, the short answer is either there's complicity or there's incompetence. <laughs> you know, not, not pleasant ta uh, choices you know, for Pakistan. I was with Secretary Clinton a year and a half ago where she said to a group of editors, it's hard for us to believe that no one in the Pakistani government uh, knows where bin Laden is. Uh, these are questions that deserve answers uh, from Pakistan. Obviously, with your report, they are embarrassed by uh, the discovery. Uh, but the real question is, how can this relationship, complex it as, it, as it is, you know, move ahead? Uh, Pakistan's a little bit in between. Um, they've had relationships with these groups in the past. Um, as I think Secretary Gates said today, they've hedged their bets. Uh, but by the same token, they've come to begin to realize that these extremist elements that are a threat to the West are also a threat to Pakistan. They've moved a little bit. Uh, they have to move some more. So how can this relationship develop very, very briefly? What is next for Pakistan it's and It's very US? complex. And, and Pakistan does play a dual game. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a question of strengthening the government to where they can face down the threat that is a threat to them as well as to others. P.J. Crowley, thank you very much indeed for joining us. All right, Jane.
Now, if 9-11 remains America's most searing encounter with international terrorism, the so-called 7-7 attacks in London occupy a similar position in British consciousness. The Al-Qaeda-inspired bombings of three underground trains and a bus on July the 7th, 2005, killed 52 people. Today in London, the official inquest into the attacks was completed. The BBC's June Kelly has the details. This summer sees the sixth anniversary of the London bombings. These inquests heard five months of evidence from over 300 witnesses. They told the story of the 7th of July. 52 were murdered. Today, the coroner said they had been unlawfully killed in a dreadful act of terrorism. The inquest looked at how London, for some of the victims, their adopted city, responded to a long-feared attack by Islamist fanatics. The bereaved families had to take in the coroner's 60-page report, culminating in a clutch of recommendations. Whatever is written down here, whatever is recommended, whatever has been said, can help people in the future, one would hope, and one would hope the recommendations are effected, but to me, they help me not at all. They do not bring my son back. A major part of the inquests focused on the emergency service response. The coroner highlighted delays in dispatching fire and ambulance crews. Our staff were brave, uh, they provided fantastic treatment and care, um, but should we have had more resources to those scenes more quickly? Yes, we should. The coroner, Lady Justice Hallett, said on the balance of probabilities, each of the deceased would have died whatever time the emergency services had reached and rescued them. John Taylor's daughter, Carrie, was one of those who did not die instantly. Could they have been saved? Well, Carrie might not have been saved. But she should have had the chance, so I should have all the rest of them. The other big area for the inquest was the role of the security service, MI5, and whether the attacks could have been prevented. The final images of the four young men who were about to become the UK's first suicide bombers. Two of them had come onto MI5's radar more than a year before they set off to commit mass murder. Prior to the 7th of July, a surveillance photo of the pair was cropped to this by MI5, as they try to establish their identities. This just one area where the security service comes in for criticism from the coroner. MI5 are also accused of failing to correct errors in a report on 7-7 by the Parliamentary Intelligence and Security Committee. Lady Justice Hallett says it's essential that the ISC receives accurate information from the security service so that it can properly hold the service to account and report to the Prime Minister, Parliament and the public. I and my government colleagues will now be considering very carefully the coroner's report and recommendations. And the families are appealing to the Home Secretary to act on those recommendations. It's not acceptable, so she'll consider them and then nothing to happen. These recommendations are, have not been made lightly. It was the worst terrorist attack on British soil. The emergency services and MI5 both say they've made improvements and learn lessons from the 7th of July. June Kelly, BBC News. Across Syria today, thousands of people took part in anti-government protests, once again defying the heavy presence of security forces. Clashes were reported in several cities and activists say at least 30 people were killed. Foreign journalists are not allowed into Syria, but our Middle East editor, Jeremy Bowen, has been following developments and filed this report. Just outside Dera, the place where the protests started, women and children joined the latest marches. They were prepared to take the risk of being shot. It's a sign of fear evaporating. That is bad news for the Assad regime. Once again, across the country and in Damascus, demonstrations followed the noon prayer. The BBC's reporting is relying on amateur pictures and information coming out of Syria. Like other news organizations, we have not been allowed to send teams into the country. Demonstrators were shot in Homs in central Syria. The official news agency reported that 10 soldiers and policemen were also killed by what it called terrorists. But human rights groups are not buying the regime's claims that it's facing an armed insurrection. What it looks like here is a systematic uh, attack on a civilian population, a political decision um, to shoot, to kill 
uh, unarmed demonstrators. And that could very well be a crime against humanity. On Syrian TV today, President Assad was still looking like the man who'd spent 11 years in power promising reform. But in the worst crisis he's faced, he's choosing repression. Jeremy Bowen, BBC News. Well, as we've mentioned, foreign journalists are not allowed officially into Syria. But a short time ago, I did speak to a reliable source in Damascus. To protect his safety, he cannot be named. I asked him first about the current situation in the capital. Now it's uh, more or less, uh, you could say, it's uh, quiet but tense. Today, after Friday prayers, immediately people took to the street and clashed with security men. And they threw stones and uh, security men and police reacted by uh, firing tear gas and, and some bullets in, 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 uh, to disperse the, the crowds of protesters. Now, as you say, this has been happening every Friday to some greater <coughs> or lesser degree, and it seems to be getting worse. Where do you see the situation developing? Well, the fact that it's happening, that this is happening in the heart of uh, uh, Damascus, uh, that's the heart of the regime, more people are participating in such kind of protests. That is really uh, showing that people are becoming more defiant, uh, people uh, uh, more uh, serious about uh, demanding change. So uh, in general, I could say that, you know, having such kind of uh, protests continuing and more people are joining, it, it makes it, you know, people crossing the uh, no return point. Well, thank you very much indeed for joining us. In Libya today, Muammar Gaddafi's regime responded angrily to the proposal by world powers to use frozen assets to fund the rebels. As the discussions over financial and military assistance continue, just how much do we know about the opposition forces? Young men from the city of Derna have previously been sent abroad to fight against America, and that's raising concerns about aiding them now. The BBC's John Sudworth has been to Derna and sends this report. If there is a hidden underside to Libya's revolution, then Derna is a good place to look for it. This coastal city not far from the Egyptian border has become famous for its radicalism. It's not hard to find out why. Late at night I was taken to meet a man who became part of Derna's now well-documented export industry. Tarek El Majiri tells me that in 2003 he volunteered to fight the Americans in Iraq. He signed up at a Libyan government office and a few weeks later was injured in battle. Today, Derna's young men are training for a different fight to oust Colonel Gaddafi from power. They now have the support of Western powers, of course, but might they soon be marching to a more militant anti-Western tune. Not at all, this man tells me. We're for moderation. We're fighting for freedom and democracy. It's Gaddafi who keeps telling the world that we're Islamic extremists, this man says. In fact, Derna has long been a center of opposition to Colonel Gaddafi. He permitted the town's disaffected young men to fight abroad, the theory goes, as every foreign fighter was one less problem for him. Once there is freedom and, of speech and uh, democracy, you will see that most of the people will live a normal life like any, anywhere else. Everybody we speak to here makes the same point. Although Colonel Gaddafi has been warning the world about the dangers of extremism in cities like Derna, it was he who was encouraging and funding its young men to go abroad to fight. The real voice of this long oppressed and neglected city, people say, is only now beginning to be heard. <laughs> Libya's revolution, they insist, will not mean more extremism, but will be a path to a peaceful future. John Sudworth, BBC News, Derna. You're watching BBC World News America, still to come on tonight's programme. The personal collection of Pablo Picasso lands in a somewhat unlikely place. We'll tell you how Richmond, Virginia snagged the masterpieces. 
hiring again. That was the news on the U.S. jobs front last month as the numbers topped predictions. But at the same time, the unemployment rate inched upwards. Michelle Fleury reports. It's been a good week for the president here arriving in Indianapolis. And this Friday brought more good news. American employers like Allison Transmission, where he visited, are creating jobs, even with the higher price of petrol. We just went through uh, one of the worst recessions in our history, worst in our lifetimes, the worst since the Great Depression. But this economic momentum that's taking place here at Allison is taking place all across the country. Another of those bright spots is this factory in Brooklyn, where they too have been taking on new staff. We saw a nice uptick in business in the past nine months, and I've been fortunate enough to add some staff. Nearly six million Americans were out of work for six months or more in April. For Felix Torres, the job search is over, but he knows what that feeling is like. For eight months, I was looking for a job, you know, um, via online at unemployment center. Manufacturers in this industrial part of Brooklyn, like the rest of the country, are taking on more staff. But they're not the only sector of the economy that are adding jobs. Fast food giant McDonald's is serving up more than burgers and fries. Last month, it went on a supersized hiring spree taking on 62,000 new staff in one day. Jasmine Inez was one of more than a million applicants. It's, it's tough out there now. The return of jobs to the private sector is welcome, but with the rise in the unemployment rate, the recovery in America's labor market still has a long way to go. Michelle Fleury, BBC News, New York. From a grim discovery in Africa to precautions being taken in Japan, these are all stories making the news around the world tonight. A United Nations team in Ivory Coast is being sent to investigate reports of a mass grave near the commercial capital Abidjan. Residents have told the Red Cross that as many as 40 bodies have been found at a soccer field. A UN spokesman said it was not clear which side in the conflict was responsible for the deaths. Nationalists in Scotland are celebrating a decisive election victory. Their party has won a majority in the country's parliament, paving the way for a referendum on full independence from Britain. The Japanese government has asked a power company to shut down three nuclear reactors at a plant on the country's Pacific coast. The move follows a safety review of all Japan's reactors amid fears that a future earthquake could cause another radiation crisis. Now to one of the world's greatest collections of art in the heart of a Paris in the heart of Paris is a museum containing Pablo Picasso's personal collection but the building is being renovated so the masterpieces are traveling the world until the work is completed now you'd expect the big cities to get a glimpse but right now the exhibition is in Richmond Virginia in this first person account Alex Nargis, the director of the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, talks about the collection and how he's giving big city museums a run for their money. Well, when John Buchanan at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco called me with the opportunity for this Picasso show, we immediately leaped at it and said, got to do it. Originally, this exhibition was supposed to be in New York City, but the New York institution wavered and that's when John Buchanan called me and said, Alex, I've got an opportunity. He took it even further. He said, I'm going to lay this out for you, and I need an answer in 24 hours. I didn't need to spend any time thinking about it. Great masterpieces from Picasso. The easy answer was yes. I told John, don't call anybody else. first thing we had to do then was go to Russia, because Anne Baldessari, who's the keeper of the Musée Picasso, the director and the curator for this exhibition, was opening this exhibition at the Pushkin in the middle of February. We literally went right to the airport the next week, overnight flight, landed in Moscow in the middle of the worst snowstorm they'd had in Moscow since 1966. We only had 39 hours on the ground 
to see her, see the exhibition, and convince her that it should come to Virginia. She knew about our museum. She knew about our new wing. We had the ability to showcase great collections from around the world, the space, the magnificence of a new museum, but also an audience here in Richmond and Virginia, and for that matter, all up and down the East Coast that was eager for something as important as the Musée Picasso. But the personal connection with her, I'm convinced, is what sold Anne on the Virginia Museum. Sometimes just showing up makes a difference. In this exhibition, which of course is just 5% of the Musée Picasso's collection, and you get to see it in this wonderful, wonderful, sinuous way, following his career in a chronological fashion, the visitor really gets to understand Picasso and his world and his life in a way that even traditionally at the Musée Picasso, you haven't been able to do. The first work of art in this exhibition comes at the very beginning of the 20th century. The last work comes in the very beginning of the 1970s. So you have eight decades represented, the entire spectrum, the sweeping spectrum of Picasso's career. His great phrase, which I love, give me a museum and I will fill it. There is a compassion that really you find by going from work of art to work of art, that if there is a thread, it's about the heart of the man which I have to say that you don't really see in major collections of his works in other museums or in some of the stars, the masterpieces that are known about Picasso. This is a very personal collection. It's, it's the collection he kept to represent the greatest works of art of what he considered to be the greatest artist of all time, Pablo Picasso. I think that taking away from the show, the one thing people will have is for themselves a greater passion for life. That's what art can do for you. Allow you not just to look, but to see. And sometimes we don't really see it all. The Virginia Museum of Fine Arts is now one of the 10 largest comprehensive art museums in America. So we can play with the big guys. Our motto is quite simple. We're bringing the world to Virginia. Alex Narges, the director of the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts there on the Picasso Collection. Well, that does it for tonight's broadcast, but you can find constant updates on our website. I'm Jane O'Brien. For all of us at BBC World News America, thank you for watching. Have a great weekend. Hello and welcome. See the news unfold. Get the top stories from around the globe and click to play video reports. Go to bbc.com slash news to experience the in-depth expert reporting of BBC World News online. Funding was made possible by the Freeman Foundation of New York, Stowe, Vermont, and Honolulu, Newman's Own Foundation, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and Union Bank. to work for a wide range of companies. What can we do for you? BBC World News America was presented by KCET, Los Angeles. Coming up, America's most trusted newscast, the PBS NewsHour, next only on KCTS 9. On the next KCTS 9 Connects. It's not quite chicken soup, you know, but it's not the worst thing you could be doing. The debate over medical marijuana and Olympia's struggle to regulate this emerging industry. We, we saw an opportunity, an opportunity to provide a, a quality service for other people. What will happen now after the governor's partial veto of a medical marijuana bill? The last thing I want to do is have our door kicked in. Tonight at 7, only on KCTS 9. When it's time to say goodbye, it's time to say hello. 
to another way of contributing to KCTS 9 by donating your old car. Call 1-877-528-7922 or visit kcts9.org slash support for more information. We'll take care of the rest. You'll feel better. Well, in a day or two. Now let's take a moment to thank those who make this program possible. A grant from A.F. Hovey & Associates, Seattle, Washington. Consultants for Employee Benefit Plans. UW Medicine Health System. Research, education, patient care. United by a shared mission to improve health. Experience the difference in your life. UW Medicine. Learn more at uwmedicine.org stories.